accounting, finance, management, and other niche professionals, have we got a treat for you. Listen while these nine entrepreneurs who turned corporate experiences into successful niche and often quite unusual businesses share their insights and lessons learned. Stick around till the end as they share what each considers to be the most important piece of advice for others considering taking the entrepreneurial plunge. Welcome to the AP Now podcast, the podcast that covers trends, insights, and emerging issues impacting every accounts payable function. I'm Mary Schaefer, founder of AP Now, and today I'm joined by eight successful, savvy, and very interesting businesswomen who have each created a niche business built on the skills they acquired in the business world. Let's meet them and hear their story. Let's start off by having them each introduce themselves briefly. Lynn? Great. Hi, I'm Lynn Larson, founder of Recharged Education, which serves the commercial card and payment industry, offering training, consulting, and resources. Hi, I'm Kelly Paxton. I am known as the pink collar crime lady. I am a certified fraud examiner and private investigator, and I help prevent, detect, and investigate pink collar crime, which is just embezzlement. Deborah? I'm Deborah R. Richardson, and I work with accounts payable teams to help them clean up their vendor data, clean up their vendor processes so that they can pay the right vendor. Brenda? My name is Brenda Bernstein. I am the founder and senior editor at The Essay Expert, and I'm also the author of the book, How to Write a Killer LinkedIn Profile. We serve mostly executives and we work with them on their resumes and LinkedIn profiles. And I also help people and coach people on their applications to college, law school, and business school. Hello, I'm Deborah Thomas Neininger, and I'm the founder of DTN Productions International, and I teach soft skills to corporations around the country. Beth? Hey there, I'm Beth Blaney, founder of Beth Blaney and Associates. We are a bookkeeping and remote office support firm, and we support small businesses and solopreneurs to help them keep their books and their businesses in order. And Hannah. My name's Hannah Hazel Kelchner. I'm the founder of Business MO and the host of the Business Confidential Now podcast. And I help organizations that are concerned about their team dynamics to help them create healthier business cultures so that they can benefit from more employee engagement and the productivity, innovation, and of course, profitability that comes with that. I'm Marie and my company is Clear Solutions and I help business owners document, clarify, and improve their processes so they can run their business more efficiently. And Deborah Thomas, who has got the greatest elevator pitch I've ever heard. Deborah, why don't you introduce yourself? my 10 second elevator speech i teach soft skills to help make people strong because life is entirely too short to not know what to do okay all righty so now um to kind of set the stage and i think this is a part that our audience will find very interesting could you please describe your previous background and experience and how that translated into your business? For example, I worked in the corporate finance and treasury for over 10 years, and then I worked for 10 years for a newsletter company writing newsletters and getting business books published for the niche that I am in the B2B space. So Lynn, you had a similar background, didn't you? Correct. Everything leads to one after another, right? I've been in the commercial card industry for well, I hate to say it, more than 20 years. And that started as a P-Card program manager for the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And from there, I fulfilled an education role for a professional association in this field. And then after that is when I started my current company, Recharged Education. Kelly, how about you? How did you get into pink collar crime? So I started in finance and then I became a special agent for U.S. Customs and I arrested your typical bad guys. But then I got my certified fraud examiner designation and I realized that women especially excel at embezzlement. But I want you to remember it's position, not gender. It's just women are in those positions where they have access to money. So I've gone from thinking criminals are just bad guys to thinking honest people can steal. And Deborah, how about you? 
Well, I'm similar as well. I was in corporate for 20, 25 years. We'll just stop there. But I came out from financial reporting. I did like the regular GL accounting type work, financial statements and that type of thing. And I even spent six years in AR. But my last 10 years was in accounts payable. And that's where I really hit my stride. And I really hit it, I mean, just out of the park when I worked for a Fortune 15 company. And so I just focused on vendors. And that's where I really, again, just hit it out of the stratosphere because I love my vendors. And so I did find, and I experienced that as a practitioner, that it's just not a big focus on vendors. And so when I came out and started my consultancy, I only focus on vendors, making sure that they're set up correctly, that fraud is reduced, and that also regulatory fines and just overall bad vendor data. Again, it was something that wasn't really focused on. So that's what I focus on in my consultancy. Well, I think I really got started in what we call the den of my parents' apartment, where we had college applicants coming in and out to be interviewed for Yale. And I started getting a sense of what it takes for a student to get into a top college. So that's where I started. I had a love of English. I was an English major at Yale. And then I also got a law degree at NYU. But kind of the whole time that I was practicing law, I was a public interest lawyer for 10 years. And that whole time I was also helping people with their applications into college. So once I graduated, law school and had a couple years of experience, I started helping people also get into law school. And some of those people came back to me and they needed resumes. So after 10 years as a lawyer, I set up my own shop and now I am the essay expert. Okay. Marie, how did you get into your unique specialty? So I used to work in the field of GIS and that's geographic information systems where you actually map out data for decision making. I did that for about 10 years and I was helping people make decisions looking at things like environmental impacts. I had to work with a lot of data from a lot of different sources and I got really good at managing information as a business analyst for many years where it was my job to come into a company and talk to the people in the business and find out the details of their work and map out their processes because none of this was written down. And I got really good at asking the right questions to gather the information I needed to clarify the work and to map out the processes. And I found I really liked it. I'm very curious. I love finding out what everybody did and then writing it down clearly. And that's really how I got started with that. How about you, Beth? My goodness, you and I need to speak. I've been on a path of systematizing and SOPs and all that kind of fun stuff. So I got started as the Jane of all trades in small businesses. So, you know, I was the bookkeeper, the HR person, the office manager, the executive assistant, the purchaser, you know, AP, NAR, and just kind of anything. Those things led me to be able to choose what my next step was gonna be. So it was really great to have this wide array of options in front of me. How about you, Hannah? Well, my leadership development work uh, leverages my background with business and law. And for many years, I don't even wanna admit how many, <laughs> I was a trusted advisor to all different size businesses and everything from startups to the S&P 500 to big tobacco and even the White House at one point in time. And I taught at two top tier MBA programs. So it was always about bridging the gap between business and law. And I know for <laughs> firsthand that what they teach in business school doesn't cover that, but yet these are things and issues that deeply affect the bottom line and business culture and helping employees bring their best to work. So that's how that all came about. How about you, Deborah? Well, after providing training for a Fortune 100 company for a number of years, I reached the so-called glass ceiling and I had an aha moment and said, hmm, I sense a need. So I did the unthinkable in the minds of many, beginning with my parents, and I launched my own company and never looked back. And that's been over 30 years. 
Congratulations. So you've all got pretty interesting stories. So now I want to share with you that Beth and I had a good laugh. And she told me that when she started her business, she thought she'd be working 30 hours a week. So I told her if it's any consolation, don't worry. I thought that I was going to have a free afternoon every once in a while to sit on the sofa and read a book because I love to read. And so, you know, now if I'm lucky, I get two hours on a Saturday afternoon to sit and read a book and that doesn't always happen. So oh, I'd like to start with you, Lynn. What was the biggest surprise to you when you started the business? I would have to say that getting into it, you know, you have a vision, right? You, you start a company and you think, okay, here are the ways that I'm going to generate revenue, make money. And after I got going, I quickly realized, hey, maybe those things aren't actually going to happen, but yet then other things started to open up. So there were opportunities that I had not considered projects that I would say went beyond my initial scope that I had in mind. And so you know, really what I learned from that is to be flexible, be willing to try something new. It not only expands your knowledge, it expands your business. So just ride the surprises is sort of the, the bottom line advice. Um, how about you, Kelly? So I want to say one of my biggest surprises is that, and this probably isn't a surprise to you guys, people won't pay for prevention. Right. Like, mm -hmm. I would love to prevent fraud. I want to do it on the front side. And I don't even think it's penny wise, pound foolish. I just think, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is optimism bias. No one thinks fraud is going to happen to them. And I mentor a lot of other professionals in my field. And I spoke with one this week from Australia, down under, and she's like, I can't get any traction with prevention. It's only on the backside. So I would say that that was my biggest surprise is that I don't understand how people don't want prevention. So I, kind of crazy. But Deborah, what about you? What's your biggest surprise? So number one, I would definitely agree with that. Prevention, you try to get that message out there, but you only get people once they've sent that fraudulent payment, once they have an audit finding, and now they have to answer to it. So I definitely agree with that. But I would say another one of my surprises or, or things that, that I, I just didn't think was going to be that way is all of my systems, getting my systems up and running and getting the things that I do on a weekly basis. I just kind of underestimated how long that would take. So I have a podcast and my first episode was, I think, 10 minutes and 33 odd seconds or so. And it took me eight hours and 10 minutes to edit that thing. So. So just getting in the in the swing of doing those types of things took a lot longer than I thought. Nowadays, I mean, it's almost done when I'm done with the podcast. But between doing the podcast, I mean, I'm on like episode 130 now. So between doing the podcast and the blogs and every other thing that, that I wanted to systemize, that was a work in progress getting it to that point. How about you, Brenda? One of the things that surprised me is how people respond to pricing and timing. I always thought people want it fast and they want the lowest, you know, price that they can get. And when I first started, I was all like, oh my God, I have to deliver things really, really fast and I can't charge too much. And it was kind of stressful. <laughs> and one client said to me that he would talk to another provider who gave him this really quick turnaround and that concerned him that they would do it so quickly. Like, yeah. Oh, okay. And I had a longer turnaround and a higher price and he actually trusted me more and chose to work with me over the person who had the, the quick turnaround and lower price. That was really enlightening for me. And I'm also surprised at how some of the, the investment that I have made takes sometimes years to actually manifest. Now, you, a lot of businesses don't make it five to the five year point, but if you can, you know, I had presentations that I gave maybe 10 years ago now, and they are just turning into these really high quality referral sources for me. So you just never know what the payoff is going to be from that investment that you make early on. Good point. Very good point. Marie? Yeah, I'd say one of the things that I see over and over that surprises me is that business owners think they don't have to really look at their processes to think they're efficient. It's like somehow they think that they'll just feel it. You know, they're just like their intuition will tell them whether it's 
<laughs> and that, so trying to convince business owners that it's not enough to just think they're efficient, you have to really look at them. And in order to look at them, you have to write them down. It's not enough even just to talk about it, but you have to write it down. And there's something about the process of writing things down that really helps clarify the work that you're doing. And especially for established businesses, they often don't, they, you know, we all do this. They don't realize how much detail they know. They don't realize how much they know and how much their employees know. And they think, well, it's not that hard. You just do this and this and this. And then when you start to capture that, you realize how much detail there is and how many decisions need to be made. And so the more you can write that down and clarify that, the better off you will be. Yeah, I totally agree. I love how everybody is kind of erring towards systems and processes and how we just kind of didn't realize at first how much we really, really needed them. Cause it's like, Hey, it's all in our heads. Right. <laughs> and we need to get that out so that it's not just in our heads. So yeah, in addition to thanks, Mary, the, the whole 30 hour a week work <laughs> week thing, I'd say I was most surprised that I was actually an entrepreneur. I thought that I was just an outsourced bookkeeper when I first went out on my own. And that, that was the plan. That was, I was perfectly happy with that. And over time, you know, just kind of going around the business scene and going to events and, and networking and things like that, I, I realized, wow, I really, I'm an entrepreneur. Like I, I want to build an enterprise. I want to do this thing, which really, really surprised me. And then the other thing was that networking is like a huge part of your job. I yep. love networking. I'm such an extrovert. I love talking to people. And now that's part of what I do. That's just being an entrepreneur is, is networking and talking to people and making connections. Mm -hmm. uh, Hannah. Wow. I, I want to echo some of the things that have already been said. Kelly, I, I so agree with you about the prevention thing. Actually, that's what what caused me to pivot somewhat because I was focusing in the beginning more about legal literacy, helping people avoid liability because every business operates on a legal playing field and most of them don't know the rules. So, you know, whoops. And one of my favorites was always smoking guns and what people would write and not realizing that hey, you just created evidence, you know, hopefully it doesn't come back to bite you. But prevention is a hard sell. And I've had people tell me that in, in other types of industries as well. Nobody thinks that anything's going to happen to them. They're good people and, and so forth. So, yeah, there, there is a bias to that. Uh, that and the time sink. I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. And, and as a teenager, I saw my parents sink unbelievable amounts of time into their business. And as a teenager, you can imagine, I was thrilled about that, right? <laughs> and so when I went off on my own, I'm like, oh, no, that's not going to happen to me. Well, guess what? <laughs> so, yeah, the, the time sink, you know, it takes twice as long than you think, probably costs three times as much. And eventually you get in a groove in a system and, you know, it gets it gets better. But you can expect to take a lot of time, but it's worth it because you're building something for you. Deborah. Deborah. Well, along the same lines of preventative, I was quite surprised to discover that many most corporations really resisted spending their budget on developing the employee. They assumed that when they hired the employee, they came to them with not only the academic background, the expertise, what have you, but that they already possessed excellent soft skills, people skills. And so I quickly discovered that often I was being brought in after the company lost a major client due to a big snafu with a people skill. So I was being asked, help them understand that being assertive is not the same as being aggressive, etc. And that yes, when you host a client at a business dinner, drinking too much is not the right thing to do. So it was quite amazing that they spent the money after they lost the business, rather than thinking in advance, how can we have everyone ready and on point? Yeah, good points. Very good points. I found them very interesting. So by the way, all these women have appeared on prior AP Now podcasts. I'll have links to their previous episodes in the show notes below and also links to their website. So if you want to contact any of them, you can. So Lynn, what is your biggest ongoing challenge? I know for me, it is the continued relentless need for marketing. 
Well, that's true. And I actually had an answer all geared up and I'll give you that one. But then listening to everyone else just now, I've come up with some new challenges that I wasn't really identifying with. You know, my initial reaction to that question is, you know, it's doing it all. It, it's doing the admin work. It's especially the IT hiccups that you may have. You know, that that's challenging, of course, when you have to drop everything and, and fix something that's broken, you know, within the realm of your computer. But I also think now listening to everyone else and, and Beth, you said something in particular, it's almost like, I think for women, especially as an entrepreneur, you don't realize it as Beth already noted. And we probably undersell ourselves a little too much. And I think, you know, Mary, to go along with your marketing comment, mm -hmm. that can be an ongoing challenge. How do you assert yourself without looking pushy? How do you fight the stereotypes that are often placed on women in the business world? And, you know, I've learned, I and mean, someone else said it earlier too, and how do you quote a project, or maybe Brenda, it was you, you know, don't be too fast or too cheap in what you're quoting. And that is so true. I have to fight, you know, the urge to, to do that thinking I have to be superwoman. But anyway, so all of you have started me thinking on, oh, you know, there's more challenges than I think, but they're all, they all can be overcome. So Kelly would love to hear your thoughts. So I hit on it a little bit, the optimism bias, but actually I want to talk about the pricing because when people come to me and they're a victim of a crime, for me to charge, mm. it's like pouring salt in a wound. Now, lawyers, no offense to the lawyers in the audience, lawyers have no problem charging. I have a, it's like, oh my God, they've just had a half a million dollars walk out the door and I feel bad for them and therefore like, I don't value my time, even though my time helping them progress through the criminal justice system is incredibly valuable. So I'm going to change it from optimism bias to pricing because I just feel bad for the victims and I don't value that time. Eventually I get it, but I, I want to help people. So I'm going to say it's pricing for me is probably my biggest challenge. So I don't know, Deborah, let's hear yours. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, Lynn talked about like being the jack of all trades and doing it all yourself. So yesterday I went to click on a link on my own site and the link went nowhere. And I'm like, who's supposed to fix that? Oh, that's me. So it's keeping up with those types of those types of things that, you know, if you were in a corporate environment, you would have someone to do for you. And all of a sudden now everything is, is on you to maintain whether you know or remember how to do it or not. And maybe Marie, to your point, I need to document some of that stuff so that I, and then maybe get on a schedule so that I get some type of organization around making sure that my website and other things that I use to, to promote my business are always, you know, 100%. But that just happened yesterday. So it was very fresh. And I really was looking around for someone else to fix that. And then it was like, well, no one else is going to fix that. And from that one that I found, I noticed, or I found that there were several others that had issues. So I, I was fixing my website yesterday afternoon. How about you, Brenda? Wow, like people have said, this is bringing up so many things. I mean, website, creating a website and getting a good person to do the website. I mean, I had so many fails and so much paid out to web developers that I just scrapped. And I set up a, like a CRM client management system with this company that was supposed to be perfect for resume writers. And it was also like thousands of dollars that ended up down the drain. I mean, so some of those things where you have to make an investment, even as a you know solo business owner, and sometimes you hit the jackpot. You know, I hit the jackpot with my virtual assistant who's helping me out. She's amazing. I have another one now who's amazing. I had some not so great experiences in between, but really making all those choices about you know choosing vendors. I mean, it's it's a really important piece of running a business, and sometimes you win, sometimes you lose, and I think that, you know, the overall category of that is even though, you know, I'm the business, but I do work with some contractors and of course vendors. So how to handle it when it's really, it's really just me at the helm. And when something goes wrong, whether that's one of my 
writers has, you know, an emergency situation and our mutual client has a deadline, you know, how to handle that because there's someone else handling the project, but I'm ultimately responsible and we all, so it's, it's been very challenging working, working with other people and navigating all of the breakdowns. And there have been so many of them along the way that can happen. And, you know, when you're relying, when I'm relying on a writer and then the writer says, oh, I, you know, I had something happen. I need to take a month off. And then I'm, you know, I don't have someone to do the work. Um, so things like that have been a big challenge for me along the way. Somehow I've managed to handle every situation and end up okay. But every time it's, it's a really, it's a hit. It's hard to get through. So for me, Mary, I think you and I are similar this way. Marketing, yeah, <laughs> that would be the the biggest challenge for me. How much marketing it was going to take, and I didn't realize how much I am not a marketer. Yeah. That is not my strength. I have a lot of strengths, and that is not one of them. And so it's kind of like I've gone into marketing, kicking and screaming, just because I yep. had to do it, and I've learned a lot. Yep, a long way, but. It's, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I know one consultant, he said that he basically spends half his time marketing, half his yeah. time working, half his time marketing. Exactly. Yeah. And it pays off. You know, that it's really satisfying when you put the energy into it and then it pays off and you get clients back as a result. But it's a lot of hard work. And I think it's just was very foreign to me. It's not really how I think. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely been my biggest challenge, along with some of the other things, what people have said. Mm -hmm. How about how about you, Beth? Oh, boy. I totally agree with, with what everybody said. You know, there are so many challenges and we overcome them. We figure it out. You know, someone said earlier something about being flexible. You know, you just, you do, you go. That's part of being an entrepreneur. So for me, I think the biggest struggle has been finding the right staff. So, you know, Deborah, I feel you there with the preventative versus, you know, after the fact. You know, I'm looking for people who are going to fit our culture and also are good at what they do. So right now I'm really lucky because I have a great group of staff, but we're continuing to grow and we're continuing to expand and finding, finding that right person can be really difficult. Like I always thought that I wanted more Beths and the reality is that I don't because those are entrepreneur mentalities and that's not what I want on my team for you know a long lasting employee i want a really good bookkeeper who has great people skills like that's that's a different profile from who i am so i don't necessarily want to clone myself i need to sort of figure out at the time who the right fit is and you know somebody that's going to grow and stay with the company so that that for me is the toughest thing but thank goodness i've got a great team right now and brenda if you're willing to share your va Wink, wink. <laughs> you know how to find me. <laughs> Hannah? Oh, goodness. For me, it's a combination of marketing and networking because marketing just seems to be this bottomless pit, you know, especially the social media area. You can't be everywhere figuring out, you know, what works, what doesn't work, what is just kind of, you know, background noise support is a challenge. And I think the, the other thing is networking because there's all different types of networking, but you know, getting into the right network and connecting with the right people, it's, it's not as easy. It's, it's harder than it sounds. At least it is for me. You know, some people <laughs> have a natural knack for it. But again, you need to be talking to the right people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that that is definitely an, an ongoing challenge. And I don't think that's the kind of thing that'll ever stop. Because if you want to grow, you know, you've you've got to keep expanding who you're who you're speaking with, who gets to know about you and, and so on and so forth. So those two things go hand in hand for me. How about you, Deborah? Well, the freshest challenge that I can think of is 2020 when my clients went from classroom in person. I was in their environment providing workshops, coaching, etc., and convincing them that yes, webinars are viable and here's how you do it. And I was shocked by how many of my clients, again, companies' names that we would assume are kind of a cutting edge 
they weren't really in the webinar world. Yes, some companies were doing distance learning, but I discovered that a lot of people just were so hesitant and afraid of how are we going to get people together? And what is Zoom? <laughs> and so it has been a learning opportunity for everyone. And I am optimism personified that I just keep talking about, grab it, own it, learn from it, don't run from it because there are certain things due to 2020 that are here to stay, such as many people working from home. Mm -hmm. Good point. Very good point. Okay. So I don't fall into this, this uh, silo, but maybe some of you do. Usually some entrepreneurs have more than one idea for a business. I had one. Okay. I'm going to be honest. Why did you just start, decide to focus on what you are currently offering? Lynn, I, I suspect you're in my boat taking our skills that we've already acquired for years and years, right? Turning it into a business, you know, yes. <laughs> that, that's really how it happened. I, I decided to, to go into business for myself because I realized I still enjoyed helping organizations in regard to commercial card payment programs. And I thought, well, I can do this on my own. I'll take the best aspects of all the other jobs I've already had in this field. And then I can focus on those as, as in business for myself. And so, yes, Mary, I was like you. I've been on this commercial card path for forever. And, you know, sometimes I think about oh, going off and being a wine taster somewhere, but I'm still in the business world <laughs> doing this. Um, Kelly, what about you? I, I've really been torn between, I kind of have two, as they call it, ideal customer avatars. I have my peers who I have trained for years, but in December of 2019, before COVID hit, I made this pivot that I wanted to help business owners prevent, detect, and know the right people to investigate embezzlement. And then COVID hit, but at the, I will never give up on my peers teaching them about this, but I really want the business owners to have this knowledge. And so I've pivoted to speaking to all different types of audiences because at the end of the day, business owners are the ones that have the money that needs to be protected. So, but I, I still get torn between my peers versus the actual victims. So yeah, that's kind of my challenge. What about you, Deborah? Well, I love my vendors, so that's always been my niche as I come out. But I will say that I did pivot during the or uh, right at the pandemic. Prior to that, I was delivering all of my services on site. And then as the pandemic started, travel was restricted. I started, that's when I started what monthly webinars. And then I also created weekly trainings and workshops that could be done online. So it's always been vendors for me, but I did pivot how I delivered my products and services once the pandemic hit. And it's actually been very popular. So that's going to be my new thing now, because I think we're still in, in, in it for a bit. Yep. How about you, Brenda? So I, I have an interesting situation because I do a lot of different types of writing and I did not choose one particular type. You know, when I first started, a friend of mine said, write down everything that you can possibly do and charge for it. And I wrote down a big list and then I picked the top five and I'm kind of still in that top five. You know, the name of my company is The Essay Expert because my first love was supporting people with their application essays into college, graduate school, law school, business school, medical school. And I still do that. But I, I think I got more onto, into the resume side and LinkedIn side because I wasn't finding sufficient volume of clients with the essays. So I still have that as part of my business. It's a big chunk of what I do. But the resumes and LinkedIn profiles were much higher demand. And so I really let the the demand dictate where I focused my business. You know, I can edit anything, but people don't all want to come and ask me to edit anything or they don't want to pay my hourly rate just to edit anything. <laughs> but, you know, the resumes, the LinkedIn profiles, their specialized areas and the admissions essays, people are willing to invest in those areas. So that's where I've ended up focusing. And you know, I, I've had the option to become a coach, an interview coach, and you know, all these offshoots of 
the careers industry and I have chosen not to go in that direction and to stay in my lane. Okay. How about you, Marie? Well, when I started my business, I was actually doing more general operations consulting to help small business work more efficiently. That was really my bottom, my main goal. And I had trouble selling it, first of all, because it was too broad. What does that mean, operations consulting? And then I come in and I realized there was just so many different ways to help a business. How, you know, how do I narrow it down so I'm more focused and more specialized? And so I kept seeing how businesses were running and they're established in their running, but they're running without clear processes and they're reinventing the wheel. These people are doing work all day and they don't actually even know what they're doing or they're doing it differently every time. And I realized this was so natural for me to write down processes and map out processes and write down the details. As we often do when something's really easy for you, you don't value it and you don't necessarily see it as other people will value it. And I did this for one company and they're like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. I said, really? This is amazing. This is amazing. This is what I'll do. And then I really focused on the documentation, the mapping out of the processes and the document documenting the details of the business. And once I started doing that, it was much easier to explain what I did and to sell it and for people to get it. And I think, you know, really a fundamental way that I can help businesses. So that's how I got to be where I am. Raise your hand if you have shiny object syndrome. <laughs> We've got almost everyone on the, okay, everyone on the panel, raise their hands. Okay. For those of you listening and not watching. Yeah. So it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough to decide. For me, you know, having been the, the Jane of all trades, you know, getting to choose which one was going to be the one that I followed through with in my business, you know, that actually, I chose bookkeeping and, and that ended up morphing back into more of being the Jane of all trades for small businesses. Instead of just one business, it was now multiple businesses, which is why we're now bookkeeping and remote office support. But then as we were growing and we were kind of like outgrowing the really, really small clients, I, you know, it was tough for me to say goodbye to, to them. And so I decided I needed to come up with another solution. So shiny object here, you know, squirrel over there. And now I'm starting a new program that's an offshoot of my bookkeeping company where people who are doing their own books, entrepreneurs can actually learn how to use their QuickBooks. So, you know, sometimes you can take that shiny object and actually make it fall within your, your program, your current offerings, your current what you're doing. And not only can you help people, but you can hopefully make a buck doing it as well. <laughs> what about you, Hannah? Oh, goodness. You know, for me, it was always about leveraging this business and legal background because I have the MBA. I've got to practice law for way too long. And <laughs> when I discovered that in advising clients, it was just so much about trying to get them to reach conclusions on their own. So asking the right questions, bringing them along and into we know what the options are. And so when I started Business MO, the whole idea about modus and Brandi, who are you? And the, and the business culture, for me, it was about creating other content to go deeper and to be able to bring people into the fold. You know, it started with a book, Business Guide to Legal Literacy. It evolved into the podcast, Business Confidential Now. It's evolved into other types of writing and webinars. You know, and the next step is another book focusing on employee engagement. So it, it expands, but it goes deeper and it also goes broader because I, I think sometimes people get too niched and especially at the higher levels of leadership, you need to have a bigger 360 view of where you're going and what you're responsible for. And if your expertise is only marketing and you see everything through a marketing lens, if something lands on your desk, that's a big IT problem, you're gonna look at it as a marketing issue. And that's not gonna be helpful 
for people to really expand and scale their business. They need to know not to be IT people, but they need to know what questions to ask so that they can get the right people in. Because like like you, Brenda, I, I had the experience with all these vendors trying to sell you a bill of goods and you want to trust them because you need the help and you want to get it done. And then you discover that they've oversold their capabilities and you wind up redoing it or paying somebody else to redo it. And it gets crazy. So I think it's really incumbent on, on leaders as their organizations grow to be able to ask the right questions. So it's a constant issue. How about you, Deborah? I'm actually quite fortunate because of the fact that my particular niche was kind of unexplored and soft skills not being something that was popular when I launched all of this. Over the years, it just continues to grow. And every week I'm designing at least one new program or so it seems, or adding on to another program. So for me, the opportunities are absolutely endless because I'm finally very popular because <laughs> soft skills are now recognized as actually being incredibly instrumental to one's success. So now, okay, my work is done because people now understand the importance. I just simply have to let them know that my programs exist. Yep. So no going back. No going back. All right. Well, that was quite informative. Before we get to the really fun part of this program, let me say that we really appreciate those thumbs up if you are enjoying this conversation. In closing, we've got one more, more question for you. What one piece of advice would you give to others considering uh, taking the plunge into entrepreneurship? And I have to tell you, for me, I'd say be flexible and be open to new opportunities. Um, and I think you were kind of alluding to that earlier. Absolutely. But you know, the other thing what, that I would say, Mary, you could probably guess, be prepared. I would suggest talking with other business owners, people who have already started their own business, just to get an idea, a list of startup tasks so you can work your way through it. Be prepared. Yep. I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and see what Kelly has to add. Okay. I'm going to say never be afraid to reach out to someone. The only reason I became a special agent for U.S. Customs was I picked up the phone and I said, I want to do what you do. So never hesitate to reach out. And it's so easy to reach out to people, LinkedIn, Twitter, you know, mm -hmm. anything. So pick up the phone. You just never know what is going to happen. Mm -hmm. okay. And then for me, I would say to make sure you get your financing in order. There's, you know, VCs out there and investors out there for if you have a product, especially if you have a tech product. But a lot of times if what you have is a service, then it's seen as a lifestyle type of company. And so there's financing out there. You just have to be resourceful about it. So don't think that all the financing opportunities Opportunities are going to be open to you, but be resourceful and find what is available in your community. Brenda? Yeah, I would say protect your time. Create your schedule. If you don't, if you don't want to work weekends, don't work weekends. Tell people you're not available. People will respect that. It's, it's, the, it's the people who convince you that you should give them a time when you're not actually available that are gonna mess with you and take advantage of you. So really stick to your guns on that. And it's okay, people do that. You know, they don't say, oh, you know, for the, to a doctor, they don't say, oh, well, could you come in specially on a weekend to see me? No, they figure out a way to meet with you when, or they figure out a way to meet with the doctor when the doctor's available during the office hours. So have your office hours and stick to them. And if you get so busy that you can't handle all the business, raise your prices. <laughs> Good answer. Marie? Yeah, and I would say before starting your own business, I would be really clear and honest with yourself about why you want to go into business on your own. So if you think this is because you're going to have a, super flexible lifestyle. You can go out and do whatever you want when you want, like you're not gonna have time. <laughs> That's not very realistic. Or you think you're gonna, you know, get fame and fortune and all that within a few years. It's, you know, be really clear about why you want to work for yourself and not work for some. If you're clear about that and you know that's what you want, then I'd say go for it for sure. Don't be shy, it's gonna be hard, but but you'll figure it out. 
Okay. How about you, Beth? Yeah. So, oh my gosh, I heard the word flexibility like a hundred times so far. And I mean, is that just the golden word for the day or what? Be open to change, be flexible, be prepared to go on a journey that it's always changing. And you're going to go down roads that not only did you not expect to go down, but that you didn't even know existed. You know, be, be prepared to be unprepared for the unexpected. And don't plan on only working just a little bit, like Marie said and, and Mary mentioned. But honestly, it's so worth it. We've, we've, I, I feel like we've, we've talked about like challenges and things that are tough. But gosh, it's so, so worth it. Hannah? Well, you're reading my mind, Beth, because I was going to say entrepreneurship is an adventure. And there's going to be times that you're going to feel overwhelmed, like, oh, my God, there's not enough time. I can't get this all done. And then something good happens and you're like, yeah, I'm back on top of the world. So it is an adventure. There'll be ups and downs. And so my advice is make sure that you have people along on that trip with you on that journey that can support you, that can help you, and that also can provide guardrails so that you don't go jumping ship too much one way or the other for the shiny objects that can be a good sounding board for you. So having that kind of support, I think will, will help you enjoy the really good times and support you for when the times are probably a little tougher and a little bit more challenging. So Deborah. Well, mine's pretty simple. Be good to yourself, believe in yourself and recognize your resilience will be tested. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, those were really good words of wisdom. By the way, for our listeners, many of our other listeners really liked episode 87, which I call the Iceman Cometh to Accounting and Accounts Payable. My apologies to Eugene O'Neill. It's about an ethical issue I faced early in my career. And if I'm going to be totally honest, I'd have to say that my boss and I made the wrong decision on this one. A link to this will appear on YouTube and will appear shortly to the left. And please don't forget a thumbs up or a share if you like this episode.